right. I got my buddy, Dr. Adam Hotchkiss. How are you doing today, sir? You're doing good, man. How you been? Excellent, man. Excellent. And Dr. Hotchkiss, you are actually trained as a surgeon in podiatry. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, definitely a, a kind of anomaly in this space. I think I'm probably the only person who would, has come from like, you know, the foot specific world into the hormone yeah. world. Um, yeah, kind of a interesting thing. But I, I was, uh, you know, I went to podiatry school, became a podiatrist, went to a foot and ankle residency. I did a rear foot reconstructive surgery residency, did a four-year residency in that. So it was definitely, you know, mainly foot and ankle surgeon. Um, I did have some hormone experience in that, uh, which was interesting and kind of led me on further down that. But really my personal experience with hormones came from a lot of personal experimentation. I was heavy into the bodybuilding world for a while and very into PEDs and the hormone sciences. And I kind of merged those two, you know, all of the medical background that I had and the scientific knowledge that I had with a lot of the bro science that I had, which in hormones is actually pretty robust. You know, a lot of these quote unquote bros and bodybuilders oftentimes understand hormones even better than you know, a lot of endocrinologists, interestingly, just because they do it sure. to the Um, But what I found in my own practice is like, I got into medicine to um, mainly because I, I got into fitness and I guess I could start a little bit earlier when, when I was very young, I actually suffered with an eating disorder myself and, and had a lot of issues with around that. And I eventually found fitness, which was really cool and, and bodybuilding, which, um, you know, I, I just fell in love with and fell in love with science and everything. And I gained a lot of weight, restored my weight, felt a lot better, fell in love with science and the whole scientific process and went to school at that point. And this was later on in life, probably around 21. Um, and I got into medicine because I thought that it would be kind of an extension of fitness and that I could yeah. you know, help people, especially when I got into foot and ankle, because I thought I'd be working with predominantly athletes. You know, I thought I'd be doing trauma and, and sprained ankles and things. Turns out that was about, you know, 2% of my practice. And the other 98% was diabetic wound care. Diabetics. And sure. Yeah. So it was the, the antithesis of everything I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be working with a healthy population and making people healthier uh, and I was instead just preventing, or I mean, not preventing disease, but reacting to disease. And, you know, I would be whittling off toes and then eventually legs. And then I'd see the person die all due to preventable disease. Um, and my kind of interest in hormones in that is I actually found a paper in, uh, from a, a Russian, um, paper, I forget the title of it, but basically showed that there was a dramatic increase in wound healing capabilities when they initiated TRT. So what you'd often find with people who have like long-standing recalcitrant diabetic foot wounds is that they have low testosterone. Sure. We'll probably talk about, you know, the metabolic implications there, but uh, when they restored their testosterone, they saw the wound healing you know, dramatically improve. So I started reaching out to my patient's primary cares and they're doing kind of a collaborative approach on let's try to maybe initiate some TRT. It's funny, a lot of the primary cares and endocrinologists were like, I don't really know how to do that, but, you know, feel free to do it. And, you know, we just worked kind of together that we monitored and I was getting a lot of positive results with initiating TRT as wound therapy, which was really cool. Um, and then eventually you know, I kind of got hooked up with Derek and more plates, more dates and the merit clinic and just went over there. And I was able to kind of leave behind my surgical practice in podiatry and work more in this field, which I've loved. So do you think if let's, let's rewind, do you think yeah. if you had a chance to redo it, would your trajectory still be to be a surgeon? Would you still go that route or would you do something else? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, that question is always so hard to be like, no, I wouldn't redo anything because I love my life now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would have definitely probably gone down. Like I probably would have just done the MD, DO route, become like primary care and done like a year of internship and then just went off and did my own thing. So I could be very lucrative and own my own clinic or something, you know. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't change anything just due to the how many cool experiences I've had. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't if I could redo it, yeah, I, I wouldn't have gotten into it because it was not my passion. Um, but I find like, you know, humans, we evolve and, and our passions vary from time to time. I was really into it at the time. I was loving it. I, yeah. I love the reconstructive aspect of it. And you kind of felt like you would get these challenges, like these 
you know, the foot is so complex. There's so many small bones and ligaments. Oh, sure. And we would have to take somebody whose the foot was uh, literally kind of melting away. There's this process called Charcot foot, where when the, the diabetes mm -hmm. to this level, the bones honestly kind of just disintegrate and melt away. We'd have to, you know, think and, and, and integrate a new kind of uh, hardware and, and build this new structure to make a new foot. And so it was very challenging and fun for the time being, but it also just weighed on me. You know, it was like having to having to watch somebody's life just deteriorate because they couldn't stop themselves from eating more or just move or something was so sad. So I wanted to get to a point where I was making sure that people never were even, you know, insulin resistant or pre-diabetic. I wanted to take healthy people and make them even healthier and empower them. So I, you know, I love this more health coaching stuff that I get to do now. And that's my passion now. So what does a typical day in your life look like nowadays in terms of how you approach client client evaluations, diagnostics, treatments, algorithms, what, what does it compare versus like, you know, the, the in-clinic setting in terms of the podiatry in-clinic setting? Yeah, that was, man, that was tough. That was a, that, that was a lot of more like a uh, conveyor belt, you know, you would just have, yeah. uh, like man, in my residency, I trained a, a VA uh, for the first half of my residency and we would literally see about 120 patients a day. It was a, Damn, dude. Clinic. There's a lot, they would, you know, they would be out the door, lying down the hall, Everyone pretty much had, you know, big bandages on their foot and wheelchairs for multiple amputations. And it was literally just like kind of a conveyor belt. Wound comes in, clean it real quick. You debride it, you apply a graft and you send them out, you know, and we'd just be doing that all day. And then we'd break and then go do surgery, which is usually amputating the foot or reconstructing a bone that's broken down. And you go back and you get back to wound care. Now, this is a lot cooler because I can meet with a guy and talk and really get to know them and figure out their, you know, their their purpose and their goal and, and what they want to do in life and work from a more holistic approach and really work on everything with them. Want to get blood work done, but hate going to the doctor? Then skip the office visit and go to bylabwork.com. Use promo code bylabwork10 for 10% off any order over $100. Because I am of the belief that the TRT, if we're talking about testosterone, like it's not an end-all be-all. It's one small drop in sure. the bucket. So I really like to dive into, you know, like the, the spiritual aspect, the psychological aspect, and then the, the lifestyle stuff and dial all that in. So we're looking at everything and from the outset, how much sleep are you getting? What's your nutrition like? What's your sunlight exposure like? What's your sleep like? And then, you know, then we'll do very in-depth diagnostic labs to see where everything is and then make tweaks. Then we can start with just making tweaks before even going into the medication realm. So it's a lot different. It's a lot more holistic and it feels a lot better. You really truly feel like you're making a difference. It's hard when you see people, oftentimes I would see people who honestly didn't even know they had diabetes. I I trained in Phoenix, Arizona for a while and it was crazy. I had quite a few people come in who they had burned off the bottom of their feet, not knowing that they had diabetes yeah. would say they would walk to the, uh, the, you know, mailbox and come back and they'd say, why is there blood all over the floor? And, you know, they had burned their yeah. feet under the bone. They didn't know they had diabetes, but that neuropathy is so far gone that we can't change that. So now sure. all we have to do is, you know, nurture that wound and hope that the bone doesn't get infected and hope that we don't have to amputate, which we usually do. So it's kind of depressing. We're here. You know, I may see somebody who's just starting to experience a little bit of insulin resistance and we can nip that in the bud, revert it and make them feel, you know, the way that they're meant to and feel, you know, empower them with these, all this education and, you know, get them on the track to feeling vibrant and young and healthy. And, and I love that. So if you are working somebody up for insulin resistance, uh, what are some of the diagnostics, some of the labs, some of the evaluations that you would typically employ for that type of patient evaluation? Yeah. I would, my, my number one favorite is definitely fasting insulin. Um, this is something I kind of harp on a, a lot of times is when guys are going to their regular practitioner, I mean, you know, sometimes you can't even order an yeah. A1C due to the, yeah. uh, due to the insurance company. They'll say, why do you want to order an A1C on a 30 year old healthy man with a normal BMI? Um, and then for the listeners, an A1C is a measurement of the, basically like the average blood glucose over the past 90 days. The glucose will kind of make an imprint on the red blood cell and the lab can look at it and say, on average, over the past 90 days, this person's blood glucose has been around whatever. Um, that is one way of looking. But what they often do is maybe just look at a fasting glucose. And I hate that because it really doesn't yeah. tell us anything. You know, it's a transient marker. Our glucose is all over the place all day long. Um, and they say, okay, you're within normal limits and send you on. And then maybe, maybe if you can get them to run an A1C, they might look at that. 
but what they you know fail to miss or you know fail at kind of uh, understanding, I think, is that insulin resistance can predate prediabetes for sometimes. Sure. Even. So they may have this underlying insulin resistance occurring and they have a normal A1C, you know, their A1C is maybe 5.4. Their doctor tells them that's okay, but their insulin is high. You know, maybe it's a fast insulin of 20 where it should be more like five, which tells us, you know, they have insulin resistance brewing, which will eventually lead on to probably prediabetes and diabetes. But those years of insulin resistance can also lead to increased risk of cardiovascular disease and dementia. Mm -hmm lower hormone levels, like we know. So I really like fast and insulin because it's just taking a deeper look. The individual shouldn't have high fast and insulin unless it's in the presence of a food, carbohydrates, proteins, et cetera. So when they're fasting, they have high insulin. That tells us your pancreas is working on overdrive and that system's dysre dysregulated. So I really like that one. Um, A1C would be next. I do find that there's a lot of genetic variability in A1C and I don't think that it should be the end all be all. I've seen a lot of people have genetic variations in their red blood cells. So you know, as I mentioned, it's kind of a, it's looking at the imprint, if you will, of glucose onto the red blood cell. And then we kind of put it up against this belief that the average red blood cell lives for around 120 days. Well, if your red blood cell lives for 140 days, you are going to be exposed to more glucose. I've seen a lot of very healthy sure. guys have a falsely elevated A1C. Um, so I don't always just do that. I also like to add something like a fructosamine, which is going to look at mm -hmm. really like the glucose imprint on something like albumin, which isn't going to be impacted by the lifespan of it. So there's a lot of, you know, diagnostic, just lab work that we can do there. There's also the use of a continuous glucose monitor, which I'm not, you know, just a, a massive fan of for everyone, though in the right circumstances, it can be very beneficial. Um, what I'm looking for with a continuous glucose monitor isn't the spikes. That's something that I really like to get across to people because I think uh, everybody's worried about, oh, my glucose spike. Well, that's normal. Yeah. We do expect it to spike after you eat. It's actually a positive thing, probably. We do want the area under the curve for how long it's up to come down pretty quickly. So I usually tell guys, you know, if you're not returning to baseline within around 90 minutes, after that spike, there may be some underlying insulin resistance occurring. You know, the insulin isn't signaling pro appropriately to the cell to let that glucose in. So we have a lot of tools that we can use, which is awesome. So you mentioned insulin resistance and its relationship with dementia. Mm -hmm. um, are you finding a new literature in that regards? Like, like it's, it, it actually caused dementia, Alzheimer's or anything of that nature? Yeah, I mean, I can't quote anything off the top of my head, but I think it's actually well known. You know, they, one thing that people will say is, you know, it's a diabetes type three. You know, we yeah, have, yeah. We have uh, you know, type one, which is like an autoimmune condition. And then we have type two, which is more caused by this uh, energy toxicity. And then people are kind of just saying type three, where these high levels of insulin and high levels of glucose are causing you know, neurodegeneration, essentially. And we kind of know that. I think that's very, very evident. Yeah. And it's multifactorial. And, and one of those even is just the impact that it's having on blood vessels, you know, it's like oscillating and causing these, uh, these kind of proteins to kind of get crystallized, if you will, and just messing them up and that screwing up the blood flow to the brain. So it's just one of the aspect of it. It also can have a direct impact on the, the neuron itself and cause that neurodegeneration. So absolutely. Gotcha. Gotcha. What is the relationship that you're seeing, or I don't know if you do see this, I see this quite a bit in, in clinic is that if you have a guy that's diabetic insulin resistance, the vast chance of him being hypogonadal, it, it, it exponentially increases. This is what's the relationship? What do you see? 100%. Yeah. And I've actually looked into this and there's some pretty well documented literature that kind of talks about these the underlying mechanisms. Eventually, you know, the this state of hyperinsulinemia, hyperlipidemia, hyperleptinemia, you know, all of these, these uh, hormones and proteins and factors that are, are too high will cause this dysregulation in multiple fronts. One is in the hypothalamus, you know, kind of where the, the starting of testosterone occurs. So you're getting this dysregulated gonadotropin releasing hormone sure. which want to cause LH and FSH to be produced. But then there also seems to be testicular toxicity. There is kind of a testy blood barrier but things can get in there and, and elevated like inflammatory mo molecules can get in there and cause dysregulation at the testy too. So it could be twofold. You could have dysregulation at the control center where your brain isn't sending the appropriate signal. Then you can actually have issue at the testes causing it to you know, not make testosterone, which is, so, you know, it, it definitely impacts it. Is your, does your treatment approach 
change in terms of if you're going to initiate TRT in a guy that's simply hypogonadal versus a guy that's hypogonadal and has insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, fatty liver, or something of that nature? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, one of the best people to kind of talk about this would be Dave Lee. I really like his approach and what he's kind of brought. Yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah. Yeah. And he, you know, he he talks about the fact that, um, you know, he kind of puts it in a way that people can understand, which I like. So we could throw around all this scientific jargon, but it's very hard for a lay person to understand that. What he basically has very eloquently said is, you know, when you're in the state of insulin resistance, obesity, inflammation, it's kind of as if your body is actively suppressing testosterone production. So if we just go in there and then we fill it full of a hormone that your body is saying it doesn't want, you know, it sure. can almost make things worse. So what I do see is if we give testosterone to a guy who is in that state, who hasn't improved those things, it doesn't help him to improve those things. Oftentimes, sometimes it even makes it worse or it may not make it worse, but it may make the, the TRT, uh, have more side effects, which I'm a firm believer there shouldn't be any side effects to TRT. No, but no. We'll see, you know, is a guy will now have uh, worse sleep apnea, or he'll experience gyno, or he'll, you know, he'll have acne, he'll be sweating, he'll have heat dysregulation, like he'll have all of these standard symptoms of TRT when he really shouldn't be. So I think what a better approach honestly is, is getting the person healthy first, or concurrently, it can be very, very hard to do at first, because, you know, if you get to that point where you're obese, insulin resistant, inflamed, you feel like crap. And it's, you know, it's very hard mm -hmm. to get off the couch. It's hard to do day-to-day -day tasks and to tell that person, Hey, lose weight. And then we can make you feel better. That's kind of hard. So sometimes you have to kind of do a little give and take and you maybe start them, but concurrently, you really have to be harping on them that, you know, we need to fix the lifestyle and we need to let this testosterone work with you, not on you. Um, and in those cases, it can be just so beneficial. I've seen guys drop weight you know, and it can be, you know, the testosterone can be as effective, if not more effective as diabetic medication. So it can be very, very powerful, but the individual has to do the work. Unfortunately, it won't do it for them. Besides, uh, using testosterone, do you ever address other hormones or are there other hormone deficiencies that you commonly see co-occurring in the presence of hypogonadism? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think thyroid would, would definitely be a big, a big one for multiple reasons. Um, let's see how to, you know, one way, one, I guess a few ways that thyroid can occur, um, you know, that the person could be void of actual adequate nutrition. So they're not getting the appropriate nutrients like zinc, selenium, iodine, things like that. Sure. So some underlying hypothyroidism there. Um, they could have dysregulated kind of uh, estradiol to testosterone ratio, especially in the obese population. What we'll see yeah. is that, you know, they have higher levels of aromatase enzyme, which is converting testosterone into estradiol. So if higher levels of estradiol and estradiol can be a direct stimulator of the lactotropes of the pituitary, causing an increase in prolactin. Um, and so they can have this dysregulation in thyroid and prolactin. So that is a big one. And, and if somebody has a low thyroid, I've actually seen that be way more detrimental than low testosterone. And, and, you know, sometimes I'll fix a guy's testosterone and they say, you know, I feel a little bit better. And we di dive a little bit deeper and go, oh, your thyroid's been messed up the whole time. We fix that. And it's like light bulb went off. Everything feels better. Um, also the upstream neurosteroids are oftentimes impacted. So DHEA and pregnenolone, those are big ones. Not always. I don't like this cookie cutter approach that anyone who needs TRT needs DHEA and pregnenolone. It's not sure. Right. No, but those are important ones to test as well. Um, sometimes you'll see IGF one lower. Oftentimes you'll see IGF one lower again, probably due to the estradiol. But when you bring the testosterone up, that oftentimes corrects. I don't usually mm -hmm. see a need to go on growth hormone or peptides right out the gate. Usually testosterone will kind of help to improve that. So, yeah, I mean, the, the whole system, you know, the entire system is so uh, closely intertwined and connected that usually if one thing's up, other things are too. And that's kind of the problem with going with just a cookie cutter approach that, you know, start TRT and, and just like, that's all you do. And, and then you just leave it, you know, you kind of got to be looking at everything and take a super holistic approach. Sure. Sure. So if someone does have, let's say a deficiency of some of the neurosteroids, like, like you said, pregnenolone DHEA, um, what would that manifest as typically, or I say typically, but what would you tip, you know, usually see as symptomatic in practice? Yeah, a big one that I've seen is this quote unquote brain fog, uh, yeah. which is interesting and something that I've been very interested in kind of trying to understand. 
Um, I personally kind of have this theory that maybe COVID caused a lot of this. And we, you know, a lot of people may be suffering from this type of long COVID, even if they don't have symptoms that are, you know, like rep respiratory in nature or smell related. Um, I think we definitely know that COVID, you know, got into the, the neurons and the nerve cells of the brain and caused some dysregulation there. We see that they usually have lower neurosteroids there too. And these neurosteroids can be kind of an anti-inflammatory for neurons and help to reduce neuroinflammation. Um, but what I'll see, you know, is, is brain fog is a really big one, um, a lack of kind of verbal acuity. So, you know, feeling like you know what you want to say, but can't get it out, can't articulate it at a loss for words. I personally experienced this for a while. And I do think it get, it was after COVID. I had a long COVID. I had a messed up sense of smell for almost two years or longer. And during that time too, you know, to be frank, I felt stupid. I was kind of concerned, like, what is going on? I feel like I'm always at loss for words, a lot of us and not knowing how to you know, articulate sure. thought and supplementing with that really, really helped. Um, sleep is another one. So people will maybe have kind of dysregulated or poor sleep where they're not having good sleep architecture. Supplementing can be beneficial in that regard. Stress resilience. So just feeling like you can't handle a little bit of extra stress. Um, immune system can take a hit and also, you know, feeling, um, I think Dave again, kind of coined, well, he probably didn't coin it, but he talks about, you know, that wired, but tired feeling. So especially when you get kind yeah. of somebody on TRT and if their neurosteroids are low in particular, the pregnenolone, if the pregnenolone is low and doesn't kind of have that inhibitory effect that can kind of calm you, you may feel overwound up kind of sympathetically driven by the high androgen level. And you don't have that kind of opposing pregnenolone force to, level it all out i don't even think anybody really understands it's very very interesting yeah 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 now in terms of trt and lifestyle what do you think are the the things that patients tend to overlook or you know not really you know implement the most when dialing their trt because a lot of times guys will always say i don't feel optimal i don't feel optimal i don't feel optimal well, what do you think is usually the, the shortcoming that you typically see Man, yeah, that is such a deep question. And I think there's so much to it. And first and foremost, I always like to define the term optimal because it's sure. a junk term that I think- I hate it, man. I yeah. hate it, dude. Yeah, it's just something that this community is kind of latched on to more for selling purposes. You know, like uh, guys will always come in and say, I'm here to optimize. And I'm like, you know, optimize for what? Like the stock market or yeah. you know, like, most guys, when they say I'm here to optimize, it means that they want to have the same level of libido that they had when they were 17. And they want to look as jacked as Chris Bumstead. <laughs> you know, that is not like true health. Not realistic, man. Not yeah. realistic. Um, so at it, it, first it comes down to realistic expectations, especially around libido, you know, should a, a 40 year old business owner, you know, married for the past 20 years with three kids, you putting one of them through college, like, should he have the libido of a 17 year old? Probably not. You know, so first it's, do you have realistic expectations about where you should be? Um, but I think there's deeper things at play too. You know, the, the spiritual health is a really big one. The psychological health, like, do you feel fulfilled? Do you feel aligned with your true purpose? You know, these big overarching questions are actually sure. really huge. And I think that more people should look into, I think it would probably be really good for most TRT clinics to almost have like a therapist that these guys can talk to. Cause a lot of times guys don't even, you know, they don't even think about that aspect of it. Uh, no. But if they're not, you know, kind of aligned, like spiritually, psychologically, that's going to be a huge issue. So that's a really, really big one. That's hard for me to even tap into because I'm always doing my own self work on that. But trying to work with a guy like, do you feel like you're living in alignment with your true self and your purpose? Is there other stuff? Because if there's other stuff going on, we're never going to be able to fix the, the health. So that's a big one. Um, but then things as small as like sleep. A lot of people are struggling with sleep these days. And I think it's largely due to our kind of artificial environment that we put ourselves in you know the, these guys are sitting inside cubicles all day looking at blue lights you know not moving not experiencing sunlight getting home and they're on you know scrolling through tiktok or instagram until the minute that they try to fall asleep then they barely fall asleep and then yeah. you know they get up and they put themselves back in that cubicle so sleep is really really dysregulated a lot of the time um, then looking at nutrition, you know, are you getting actual nutritious foods or are you just eating these, you know, highly palatable hypocaloric foods that are full of energy, energy so much that it's causing energy toxicity, but lacking fundamental nutrients for hormone production. So a lot of times just dialing in the diet. And I kind of look at that as kind of a 
kind of have this pyramid of, you know, start first with like whole foods. I don't care if you're getting whole foods from the, the cheap market and you're just start eating, you know, a lean meat and a potato and it's all GMO and pesticide, whatever, just start there. Yeah. And then, you know, once you get the money and, and, and the time and everything, and you can more start eating organic and things, great, start doing that. And you kind of have this hierarchy, but first and foremost, just start eating whole food and limit the processed stuff. Um, you know, start getting outside, start doing daily movement to some extent. All of these things that, you know, historically we would have just done naturally that our grandparents and everybody before them just did like moving around, experiencing, uh, you know, getting sunlight, sleeping normal hours, do all of that stuff first. And unfortunately, the way that our whole environment is set up right now is completely against us, you know, and also, unfortunately, a lot of times guys are doing all the right stuff, especially now there's kind of this, you know, zeitgeist of health, op health optimization going around. And a lot of people are doing a lot of the right things. We've got the Andrew Huberman's that you know, millions of people listen to. And he, I think he gives really good recommendations and guys will come in and, you know, they're saying I'm getting two hours of sunlight a day. I exercise. I don't look at any blue light for a few hours. I eat this perfect diet and they still have low hormones. Again, I think we're kind of in this where everything's set against us. We have things like endocrine disrupting molecules that even if you do everything perfect, you may still yeah. be exposed to, or we're maybe exposed to in the womb. So it, I love to say, you know, it all comes down to lifestyle and, and everybody could have adequate optimal testosterone levels if they just dialed in their lifestyle. Unfortunately, it's not the case anymore. And that was something I had to come to terms with that I didn't believe at first. I kind of thought, you know, no guy who's 25 should have low testosterone levels if he's doing everything right. But I've seen enough of those guys. I'm sure you have too. Yeah. It's like, damn, you really actually are doing everything right. And you still are only pulling a 200 testosterone and you feel like crap. And that's when I think it can be beneficial. But it's kind of hard sometimes to tease out who is the person who's actually, who's saying they're doing everything right versus the person who maybe thinks yeah. or is lying to themselves about doing everything right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned the spiritual side of things what would what are some of the, the practices or some advice or some of the techniques that you would give your clients what, what are some of the things that you feel really enriches that well probably one of the most innate things i would say is just first be alone and get comfortable with being alone and ideally do it outside and in nature you know i think there's a Nature's profound and, and huge. It doesn't matter what denomination you are or what you believe in creator, or even if you simply believe we evolve, but you probably feel there is some connection you have to nature and some just being outside and being alone in that can be massive. You know, I just, just take a moment to stop thinking about everything that is going on in your life, the work stresses, the spouse stresses, the kids stresses, and just take it all in and feel how small you are is, is kind of, mm -hmm is really interesting, but then yeah. also that you're a part of this massive thing and that, you know, you're absorbing energy from the sun. And then one day, you know, you're going to go into the ground and things are going to eat you and take your energy. I like to do these mental mind games with myself. Yeah. You know, sometimes just stop and think about, wow, I'm a part of a really cool existence. And it doesn't have to have a denomination behind it. You know, a lot of people maybe don't want to be linked to a certain religion or to dominate. And that's fine. I think that, you know, to be spiritual doesn't mean to be religious. Yeah. Um, and being spiritual too can have be having belief in yourself. It can be having belief in your relationship. So just feel spiritually fulfilled, whatever that means to you. And I don't, I don't have a certain definition for everybody. I just think that we all know that there's a little bit something more than just, uh, you know, there's a little bit something deeper to us than just our, our brain and, and our, our skin, our tissue, our muscles. There's a little bit something deeper inside of us and trying to connect with that and figure out what that is. Um, and I think most men kind of lack uh, knowing their true purpose, and it can be kind of hard to figure out what your true purpose is, and that may be, and that may evolve. Uh, you know, like for you and a lot of practitioners, that may be, you know, I want to help people to feel their best, and and I want to create something too. And and you know, you you create the restore clinic, and you feel like you help other people, and you feel like that's your true purpose. And if you feel aligned with that, that can be very spiritual like liberating and, and very you can feel very spiritually aligned what happens to a lot of us is we just try to make ends meet and we take the job that we may not have been very passionate about that we don't feel is you know our true purpose and we don't feel aligned with that then we feel very spiritually disaligned so there's a lot of uh, things but first and foremost you know i think getting outside is a really big one maybe trying to read various texts and uh, i kind of like to read a lot of the 
different religious texts. You can read the Bible, you can read Buddhist, Hinduism, like they're they're all very similar when you read them too. And you'll find that, you know, there are these universal truths when it comes to spirituality, it seems. Um, I really like for most men to read uh, a book, The Way of the, or is it The Way of the Superior Man, if you're familiar with that one. Um, David Data, it's a great book. And I think a lot of young men could benefit from reading that. So I do like to give out a few you know, texts, you know, listen to this on Audible while you're walking around outside or something. That stuff can be huge. So if one thing I'm starting to see when I read more literature about spirituality, about finding purpose, about community, I'm finding that a lot more men, they don't have any community. Most it seems like most men don't even have a friend. Yeah. Why do you think there's so much disconnect going on now? It's worse than ever is what it seems like. A hundred percent is worse than ever. And it's just, I think it's just, uh, again, our, our environment is kind of working against our natural innate, like ancestral way that we still have this DNA that is, uh, you know, made for our ancestors, but we are in this new environment. So I do think it was very important for us to commune with others, to talk with others, to be part of something, to be a group. And that kind of helps us with our spiritual you know, fulfillment as well. But nowadays we don't need to be, you know, you don't need to go get with other people yeah. to get something done. It's as easy as making, you know, clicking on your phone and then you get the thing that you need. Um, but yeah, I think that that's really, really messed guys up. And that's one thing that I, you know, I try to tell people, you know, in the past, even, even, you know, 20, 30 years ago, there was bowling leagues and there was church yeah. that people were going to. Nowadays, there isn't. And it, you know, we can meet on here and, and talk on Zoom occasionally, but it still doesn't really seem to do it. And most people aren't doing this either, right? You know, if, if you and I want to talk, we're probably yeah. going to text each other. Uh, sure. You're not really even hopping on a video call. Um, but we lose that connection and that can be huge for guys and, and it's hard to find, but, you know, I think they're popping up more and more. I do see this kind of resurgence of people pushing back. I think we were all kind of got fed up. I think it hit a tipping point when we were all in lockdown and we saw how yep. detrimental our new lifestyle is on us. We all felt so awful. But now, you know, every big city, you can see these run clubs pop up where, you know, young guys who aren't even runners are just coming together and running together. It's so cool to see. And, you know, uh, my farm, farmer's markets are just blowing up. I see so many people there and they're doing yoga there. Yesterday, there was a yeah. class at mine. It's really, really cool to see. But I think that you need to put yourself into one of those, especially as a man, young man, older man, whatever, and find some, especially be around other men too, and kind of allow, allow yourself to be vulnerable with those other men and allow them to push back on you and put you in your place. Cause you know, we do need that as men. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think, or what has worked for you now that you've transitioned from one major move and now you just recently moved, what has worked for you in terms of finding your own community, finding your identity within that? Cause anytime, you know, you get up and move, you are, you're becoming vulnerable to the world. You really are. So yeah. what have you done to help you integrate into that society here? Yeah. Well, I was really lucky. We moved in such a cool area in Michigan, literally the first day when we first pulled up, I, I felt like I got transported into, you know, like the fifties you see on movies. That so sounds awesome, man. Neighbors started walking over immediately and saying, Hey, Hey neighbor, like nice to meet you. Yeah. My neighbor came over and mowed the lawn the first day we were here because I know that's a good day. Hell yeah. Yeah. There's a guy that, you know, across the street, he's like, Hey, I've got chickens, you know, let me know if you ever need eggs. And I'm sorry if he wakes you up in the morning and it was just so cool. You know, everybody started coming over. So I, I think the area you're in is, is really important, but um, I also have stayed just close with my guy friend just over the weekend. My good guy friend stayed with me for the weekend and we just did, you know, a lot of talks and a lot of, you know, got vulnerable with each other. We went on long walks and talked about really important stuff. Um, so I think, you know, even... Even if you move into a new area where you don't know people, try to make friends. You know, yeah. go to one of those running clubs or go to yoga or go to a CrossFit or go to a gym and ask to work in with a guy. A lot of good relationships are built at the gym, just, you know, pushing each other and spotting each other. Um, try to find some people or have your friends come visit you. And, and as we get older, you know, our, our time is usually going to be spent with our wife mm -hmm. or our kid. But I th do think we should carve out time at least maybe every few months to have a guy's weekend. Yeah. And that weekend should, you know, be hunting, fishing, going on walks, riding bikes, working out together, you know, doing something, but getting vulnerable with them too. And try not to make it just superficial, like open up with them and, and, you know, let them know what you're dealing with, hear what they're dealing with, give each other constructive criticism. We need that. Man, I love that you said that. Make yourself vulnerable because 
uh, so many men they they perceive that even today they they perceive that as being you know a pussy so to speak they yeah. they, they don't want to open up they don't even want to open up to their own wives so yeah. how do you encourage men to just you know just, in in my interpretation that is that is truly being a man and that yeah. is how i look at it. being a man is being open so how do you encourage these men who perceive that as weakness as being afraid so to speak yeah, it's tough. I know. I think we, all it. but I think just, you know, relaying to them that, you know, you should, and maybe as a practitioner or a coach or somebody, you're kind of put in that role. And I think you need to allow them to talk to you and vent to you and encourage them to, and try to get deeper than just, uh, you know, get deeper than just the numbers on paper. We, we don't treat lab markers. We treat the individual. And, you know, if you're going to be a practitioner, a coach, whatever, you know, you need to look deeper than just the objective markers. Got to dive into this objective as well and talk to them and start it there. And maybe if they, they find that they could be open with you and they'll feel that cathartic feeling, then maybe they could keep going and, and doing it on. Um, I do, you know, again, when, when I'll have them read the, the way of the superior man, he talks a lot about masculine and feminine energies, and it makes a lot of sense, you know, and, and, and trying to get in tune with their masculine energy. Um, and I, I find that most people, as soon as they start doing it, they feel so good that they don't want to stop, you know, that then they just have to break through that first little stigma, as you said. What, what it exactly is, for people who don't know, what exactly is or what's the interpretation of have, possessing like feminine energy? What, what exactly is that? Yeah, so feminine energy, I, mean, I guess the, the way that like David Yeda would uh, describe, which I agree, it's kind of the, which is very interesting. What I take away from the book, which I think is very cool, is uh, he kind of talks about women as being this kind of ever-changing flow, full of love and always wanting love. That's what they care most about is wanting to be loved and having uh, kind of, they're kind of like the ocean. The man is kind of like the rock and, and needs to be strong. And the women is always evolving and moving, you know, they're dancing um, their nature, their, their, the ocean. Um, but if you look at the universe is also kind of being the feminine energy and the man needs to kind of penetrate the woman and the man needs to be the rock and stern. And I kind of look at that as, you know, you need to go out and penetrate the world too. You need to give the world your gift, which is love. Uh, you need to, uh, you know, embrace everything with love. You need to give the universe love. You need to give your woman love. You need to give feminine energy love. The man needs to be the rock, the stationary, the strong one who gives love and the woman takes in love. Um, so, you know, women, women are always taking, men are always giving. It's the way that I look at it. And men, I feel like need to be giving. If men are just taking all the time, having things done for them, they don't feel like a man. And I sure. feel like it it can really help them to feel like they give, that they're giving back, that they're giving back to their woman, they're providing for their woman, or they're providing for their patients, or they're providing for their clients, or they're actively working on something. They're going to build a YouTube channel. They're going to build an Instagram, whatever people do these days. We need to be giving. I feel like men really feel, you just feel better when you're giving. It, you know, even when you look at it from just the biological, you know, we give our, our sperm, our semen. Like it makes yeah, sense. Yeah. You know, we are giving creatures and we need to be giving back. And if we can do that in love and know that, you know, what we're doing is we're giving to the world, we're making money by giving to the world, we feel very aligned. So what do you think it is biologically, genetically, that hardwires men and women to possess different types of energies like that? Because yeah, some know. people just some people just innately say, well, it's just your hormone. Yeah. But if you think about it, women also have more testosterone than estradiol naturally. So you can't really just blame on that. So what do you think genetically is going on? Yeah, I don't know if there is a genetic thing where, you know, we're getting into this like deep philosophical kind of debate, which I have no idea. It just- I, love, I like it though. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. I love this stuff. This is, see, I love this stuff. I think men should do more of this. We should philosophize and talk about things that we don't know and deep stuff. Um, but I don't know, it, but there does seem to be something innate there. What's interesting though, too, is I do think that men can kind of be more feminine, have more feminine energy and women can have more masculine. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, um, but just, you know, you, you kind of need to know which one you're more aligned with. Um, if you are if you are somebody who's more aligned with the feminine, it's not a bad thing, uh, sure. but you may feel kind of, you know, this dissonance if you have more feminine energy, but you're trying to be a man and maybe you just need to embrace that more feminine. I'm not saying, you know, get a sex change. I'm not, we're talking more about energies here. Yeah, um, yeah. It's all just so deep. I don't know. I don't know, but you're right. It doesn't seem to be just hormones because, you know, we, we can, we even see like female competitors in bodybuilding who have extremely high testosterone levels, but they're still very feminine women and that, you know, they still have those, those feminine energies. So I don't know, it's something deep. Which tells me again, you know, it's deeper than just biology. 
And I'm someone who was for a long time, I wouldn't say atheist. I was just, well, I was maybe atheist for a while and then very agnostic. Then I'm, you know, I'm just sure that there is something more there and there's more than science can, can prove. Um, and I think that we need to just embrace that. Yeah. 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 So if you now you're, if I'm not mistaken, you're 36, correct? Yeah. So what would you tell your 20 year, 20 year old self as if you're trying to tell him, here's how you're going to enter the world. Here's how you're going to enter manhood. Uh, what kind of advice would you give that young man? I guess first, maybe it's tough. Again, it's like that, the whole thing of like, I don't want to redo anything because all of my experiences. Made sure. But what I try to tell people, I guess, is try not to be, try not to be too selfish. I think we should, again, always come look at a place as how can we give, how can we give back to the universe and the world, which young men aren't really thinking about. It's a lot of me, me, me. Yeah. And that gets us into a lot of trouble. Sometimes we become very selfish and we're not giving. And so then I don't think we get things back. Uh, Cause I do think uh, whether it's karma or whatever, what we give, we seem to give back. So when we're giving abundance, we're giving good love and energy into the world, we oftentimes will get it back. So I would first, you know, try to try to approach everything that you do is a place of giving. What what can I do to make the world a better place, even if it's a small thing? You know, start there, um, and try to figure out who you are, which is tough, and and screw up a lot. Yeah. Especially the younger guys, I do tell them like I don't really want to tell you too much here because part of this process of growing is just fucking up a lot. Fuck yeah. up, man. We want yeah. you to. It's good. Yeah, we all do it. We all do it. Um, but. A big thing does come in with the 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 physical health as a big role in there because what a lot of younger guys are doing is kind of poisoning themselves and living very you know they're very discongruent and there's a lot of dissonance there where they're they're living such unhealthy lifestyles that they can't feel spiritually fulfilled either they kind of all go hand everything's interconnected just like the hormones you know if your physical health is screwed up you're not going to be spiritually healthy and vice versa um, so sometimes it's easier just to find physical health and young guys are, are pretty good at doing that, especially, especially when you tell them they're going to have a six pack and get more girls at the end of it. Yeah. Uh, so if you dedicate your twenties to, you know, trying to get very, very fit, that can be profound. And I think that's probably one of the best things you do is, you know, dedicate your twenties to being in the best shape of your life, really figure out, you know, your physiology, and then the spirituality kind of comes with all those experiences you get. Um, work really hard to, you know, try to, again, try to give back, try to learn a lot. Realize sure. that, you know, I think it was in the Bible that basically says that, you know, there's there's no work goes unpaid. So even if you're working a minimum wage job, you're flipping burgers at McDonald's, like learn from that and work really, really hard in your 20s and, and you'll get paid from every experience that you do. Um, so yeah, those would be the main things. So get really fit, work really hard. Those are the big things for the 20s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a, a, an, an adage that anybody can live by is yeah. you got to work, man. It, there's nothing that comes easy. There's no free ride, man. There's really yeah. not. And I fall in love with that work. You know, I, I was uh, thinking the other day about, you know, I was thinking about a past fire. You you have a, a newborn. Um, yeah. yeah. Thinking about babies well they love the pacifier and the pacifier there's no milk at the end of the pacifier which is like you know weird why are they sucking on it well i think that you know humans fall in love with the process and we should kind of look at everything is that way too like we don't always need the milk we don't always need the reward we should fall in love with the process and oftentimes the process feels better um i don't know you may have experienced this i experienced this you know i was working for my degree for over 10 years when i finally got it the next day was one of the most depressing days i've ever had sure what the heck? So I learned at that point, like that process was what I really craved and what I loved. So fall in love with the process of evolving and working hard. You know, the, the goal isn't really the spec, like when you hit the goal, that's not a special thing. Fall in love with the process of doing all of the work and becoming the better human. And you're never going to get to the end. Hopefully, hopefully we never do. I mean, maybe when we're late, you know, our last breath will feel like, oh, we're fulfilled. We did it all, but fall in love with that whole, the whole hill. Run right on, man. Run right on. Advice that anybody can live by, man. I love it. I love it. I do have a couple PRT related questions. I love the epistemology that we're going over there. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. that's something no one ever talks about. I love that. But one of the TRT questions that uh, one of the people have chimed in on is that they want to know uh, what is your what is your interpretation? How do you perceive SHBG? What is the implication? You know, does it carry as much weight as people think it does? I'm kind of curious, like, you know, how does it influence your treatment? And you're not 
SHBG is a very tough one, especially with a natural individual, uh, especially with a young natural individual. Um, SHBG is something I've really pushed back on the community a lot on because you know when we look at SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, it's actually more associated with good metabolic health and low state mm -hmm. inflammation. Well documented that having high insulin and having high inflammation, in particular, it seems like inflammation really suppresses SHBG. Does it make sense to me that whether it be, you know, through evolution or divine intervention, that we would have this thing that gets higher and is when we're healthy and that's somehow pathologic. But what the TRT clinics will have a lot of young men believe is if your SHBG is high and your free testosterone is low, you need TRT. There's something wrong with you. And I push back on that a lot. Uh, because I've seen, you know, plenty of young guys come in who have robust levels of testosterone, you know, they may be like 900 or 1000, which just having that much testosterone, you need higher levels of carrier hormones. So their SHBG will also be elevated. And sure. they're all very healthy, they have low inflammation, they have, uh, you know, low insulin, so they have high SHBG and low ish testosterone, but they feel great. So I think the most important thing, which, you know, all your listeners probably knows we need to go off of symptoms. And if a clinic is telling you that you need TRT simply because the piece of paper says that your SHBG is high, I would run, uh, you know, unless sure. you actually feel like you need it. Where it does seem to be probably a bit problematic is in older individuals. And I don't know where the, the kind of age is, but, you know, probably 50s and, and older guys will start to have higher and higher levels of SHBG and their liver seems to turn it over, you know, less efficiently. And so then they kind of run into issues where this higher SHBG is binding up a lot of the testosterone, not allowing the free testosterone to kind of be metabolized into other metabolites. And they're feeling the ramifications of that. Um, in that case, you know, you could have a guy who has a 900, but a very high SHBG who absolutely feels awful, who may need TRT just to lower that SHBG. Um, when the guy goes on TRT though, then SHBG, that's a really, really tough one. Just testosterone alone has such a suppressive effect on SHBG, um, you know, the, the initiation of it. It's pretty rare. You know, I'd say at least like 50% of guys or more will just have very low SHBG and it could be fine. The problems, there's a few things that you kind of got to, to go through with them. You know, is their free testosterone too high and things to look at with that for me are kind of like, are you experiencing anxiety or insomnia? Those are two really big ones. Uh, if you kind of have this sympathetically driven feeling where you're always in fight or flight, and that will happen to some guys if their, their SHBG is too high and they're free or too low and their highest, their free is too high. At that point, we work on maybe lowering the dose and getting the free testosterone lower, or we maybe increase injection frequency, which will sometimes have an increase in effect on SHBG. Um, again, I guess this is uh, assuming that they're healthy and not in a state of uh, inflammation. Sure. Um, and then other times, you know, maybe their SHBG is kind of resistant to the TRT and it's remaining high. And at that point, maybe we push doses a little bit higher to try to lower the SHBG or at least get higher levels of free, or we reduce the frequency. Um, I found some guys feel better on only two, even though, you know, a lot of people will say three and more is the ideal. Well, maybe not. Some people feel better. Sure. on two. I've occasionally even had some guys say, I feel my best when I just do one injection a week. And it's because they have such high SHBG that that brings it down and they just feel better. So again, not being dogmatic or having a cookie cutter approach and really working one by one, what feels good for you. For one guy, they could be doing one bolus and another guy could be doing seven micro injections. One's not better than the other. It's just, it's their individual physiology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I'm saying is like, most tier T clinics now, it, they kind of remind me of like pill mills, like 10, 15 years ago, yeah. everybody gets the same thing around the gates. Uh, how, what do you, what do you see, or what do you predict for the quote unquote, the tier T community, this profession, uh, how, where do you see the trajectory in five, 10 years? That's hard. Cause I don't know what the government regulation will be like. It can kind of go two ways. Either they'll crack down on it more because a lot of non-medical providers are making a lot of money on this space by exploiting kind of medical providers and exploiting young guys and putting people on testosterone who don't need it. So we could get see a crackdown where it's even harder to get it. Or we have, you know, the whole gender thing that may push to make it more accessible. And sure. I think that would be nice. When it comes to like the, the approaches that the actual TRT clinics are doing, 
Um, one thing I've often said is, you know, a lot of these clinics you say they're not cookie cutter. They are a cookie cutter. It's just a different cookie. You know, it's just a different shape because sure. again, you know, we have, we have kind of the traditional ones that maybe came out 10 years ago where it was, everybody gets 200 milligrams a week, one injection with an AI and HCG. Mm -hmm. And then they got this newer wave that said, everybody gets three injections, 120 milligrams a week uh, with no AI ever, you know, you can't even bring up the word AI or you're going to be, you know, ostracized uh, where, you know, I think that it needs to kind of just be like what the conversation we just had where each individual has their own approach. I've seen guys be on as low as like 70 milligrams a week and feel awesome up to 200 milligrams a week and need that. I've seen, you know, one injection to seven injections occasionally I've seen a guy need an AI for a short period of time, maybe due to their body composition or underlying issues. And I don't think that we should say that one treatment is the treatment for everybody. It should be a case by case. And unless you're willing to kind of take each case uh, separately, individually, I don't think that you should be really, you know, in that space. Sure. Sure. Uh, and you think about, it, you just, you said that there's going to be all these guys that are on it that don't need it. How is that going to affect society 10, 15, 20 years down the road, man? I don't know. I don't know. I've been, I've been wondering that too. We also, I'm very pro TRT, obviously. But, sure. Um, <laughs> I sometimes wonder, like, we don't actually know if there are ramifications to just shutting off LH and FSH indefinitely, you know, sure. like, what if there are other receptors that the LH and FSH interact with that are essential for, you know, optimal living? We don't know. So I don't know. I think it's yet to, to be told. I, I never like to tell anybody that I can say with 100% certainty that TRT is 100% safe and, and perfectly, you know, perfectly safe for everybody. We just don't fully know. Um, it would be interesting though, like, you know, if a lot of guys are being put on it who don't need it, shoot, that's scary. Cause you know, what if they come off and now they are hypogonadal? Uh, conversely though, maybe with all the endocrine disrupting hormones and, uh, and, and all the lower testosterone, maybe these guys being put on and, and we have us having a generation of guys full of higher level energies, maybe it'll be a yeah. positive thing for society. You know, maybe we'll get back to, to, you know, like the forties and fifties when men were men and, and we had these, uh, these, uh, very masculine kind of figures. I don't know. So it could go either way. Sure. Sure. Well, man, dude, you've been with us for the last hour. I appreciate it, man. Uh, any any final words, anything you want to give people a, a way they can reach out to you? Sure. Yeah. The, um, my Instagram usually try to get back to people. It's just Dr. Hotch, uh, D R H O T C H. Um, I just opened up a diagnostic lab company that people can go do their own labs, which I'm really passionate about right now. It's called algo DX just algo DX AI. It's a, a place where you can go on as we talked about earlier, sometimes it can be very hard to get labs done by your provider. Sure, I want to sure. make it accessible to everybody. And most importantly, at a very affordable cost. Uh, when I was coming up my whole life, when I was kind of abusing steroids and doing things, I struggled to get labs sometimes because, you know, I'd be looking at $500 to $1,000 to order my own labs. And, you know, as a college student, that's a lot. So I tried to make a very affordable platform for people to be able to go to, to just get some self-service labs. So if you want to support me in any way, that'd be the, the, the best way to do that. Are you going to be, now that you're in Michigan and you're relocated, you're going to be launching your own clinic? What, what's your future hold in the next few years? Um, yeah, I think I, I well, with Algo, you know, if, when people get their labs, if they want some coaching, I could do that. I kind of do personally want to get away from the prescribing and, and pushing of anything. I really want to take a more holistic approach and work with the guys more on the stuff we've been talking about, you know, that deeper stuff, just being a guy for them and maybe a role model to talk about the deeper stuff and, and maybe working on the nutrition side. One thing, even, even getting with, you know, like Mayor Kelf, which I loved as, as the provider, I didn't have enough time to really connect with the guys and the health coaches did. And I kind of longed for that. I was like, you know, I kind of want to just be more of like the coach. Um, so I really want to, do more of that. And I'm, I'll try to maybe build that out. Um, right now, the, the algo itself is such a big process and taking a lot of my time, but I hope to get to a point where I can just, you know, coach guys one-on-one -on -one and maybe not prescribe anything and just see, you know, if I could be their kind of male coach. Sure. Sure. Right on, man. Well, we appreciate you joining us today, man. Um, it was awesome. Uh, as always, man, you rock, dude. Thanks, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Have a good one.